There's stuff between me and people. I'm like, you know, get that out of the way, you know. So I'm glad uh, you guys could be here tonight. Uh, how many of you were here last year? Okay, good. How many? So the rest of you, this is new. How many of you, uh, this is not your, your home church? Okay, good. Some visitors, good. Uh, you guys traveled in from Pennsylvania, different places. Anybody come from out of state? No? All right. Well... Still working on that one. <laughs> I'm playing with you. No, it's good. All right. So uh, since the last time I've been here, uh, it's been just amazing. Some of the things that God's done, I want to sort of catch up with, with those of you that I have a relationship with and look forward to getting to know the rest of you. We're going to be here tonight, uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, we have another training session, uh, and then we have some opportunity to actually uh, go out together, uh, grab some lunch, and to uh, just enjoy being sons and daughters of the of God in the world around us and, and watch God touch the world and just love people, uh, let Jesus love on people through us. It's really a fun thing to do. And if that makes you nervous, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Cause, and so we're going to address a lot of those things that try to hold back this love. Why is it that our first reaction to those kind of things is fear and, and nervousness? And so, you know, it's really fun when we break through all of that um, because because the breakthroughs that God does in our hearts to make us comfortable um, living out of the life that He's put inside of us actually make a difference everywhere else. You know, you can't be in shape in one area of your life. You know, if you're in shape, you're in shape. You know, you're ready to play basketball, football, whatever. You might have a different talent level at each sport, but if you're in shape, you're ready to go. Amen? Uh, and so then you have uh, tomorrow evening, uh, Sunday morning, and then Sunday evening. We're going to be kind of covering each night can be a standalone, uh, but there's going to be a real uh, progress uh, of what we're doing. So tonight I just want to really lay a bit of a foundation, give an overview, um, and then we're going to have a little bit of a break because you know it's a two-hour session kind of thing um, and and then we'll uh, come back and we'll have some ministry time uh, after uh, the break and uh, be sure and check uh, the book table uh, during the break and then afterwards uh, there is a e-newsletter sign-up sheet. Uh, so that's one of the ways that I'm able to communicate with all these uh, the people that I meet uh, in the various places. Uh, I send out uh, monthly e-newsletters. They have uh, fresh words of encouragement, uh, fresh video uh, uploads that are featured, uh, new testimonies, things like that. And they also let you know when I'm going out on my next mission trip. So you can uh, potentially, if you're interested in being part of that, uh, that's where the teams come from. Uh, might have some opportunities to go to Japan and India uh, next year. Really looking forward to that. Um, all of that's still in the works. This past year, uh, in March, I had an opportunity to go to Kenya. Uh, and we went there. Um, and what we do is a little bit different than, than what Richard does. You know, it, there, it takes a body and different focuses and approaches. Uh, and one of the things that we do is we do these kind of conferences overseas and we equip uh, leaders and ministers of the gospel to, uh, I, I, I basically say this, that whatever you're doing Sunday mornings is wonderful, but what if that's not really all there is to church? What if that's a small part of what ministry really is? What if ministry isn't organizing programs and committees and managing budgets and resources and those kind of things? What if ministry is you walking like Jesus teaching other people to walk like Jesus so that you can know God in such a powerful way and be so filled with Him that you're actually equipping other people uh, to walk in His fullness wherever they go. And it's so exciting to see. Uh, I just remember one pastor, his name was John. We did, we did this conference, and part of what we do at the conferences is that the teams that go with us, they become the miracle teams, right? And so they take uh, uh, people that are part of the conference. They come there for the training, and they, and they take them out to actually go house to house, walk around in the marketplace, the streets, and those kind of things. And they just introduce themselves and say, hey, we're praying for people and believing God for miracles in Jesus' name. 
name. Do you, is there anyone here sick? Anyone here need any prayer for any reason whatsoever? And it's so cool because they always come back with tons of salvations, people getting saved, people getting healed, people getting set free. Um, and I remember John just looking at me and saying, I always wanted a man of God to lay his hands on my head so that I could receive the power to work miracles like I see at the Crusades. I always want the Crusades to come back because I know these things could happen. But now I know I don't need a man of God to lay his hands on my head. And I know I don't need a crusade and a, uh, and a, and a, and a, to, for the miracles to take place because I have seen God use miracles, uh, do miracles through me. And you know, when you understand that miracles aren't... uh aren't happenstance. They're not, uh, they're not God deciding He's going to be in a good mood today. They're, they're not, you know, hey, you rolled the dice and it came up, ha, you, we got, you know, we got lucky today. Uh, it's not like that. It's actually the very nature that God uh, put inside of each one of us. And so, uh, but that nature is not just a nature that we do miracles by. It's the nature that has so much more to it that we can learn to live by. Because when Jesus did miracles, how many of you know one of the names for miracles in the New Testament is called signs, right? Now, driving around in America, yeah, I, I, when you, every now and again you're driving, you're like, man, I'm really hungry, or I really need to go to the bathroom, or I really need to make a stop for some reason. And you're driving on the interstate, and sometimes you see these little blue signs, you know, there's like food at this exit, there's gas at this exit. And I'm like, great, because I, I, need, I need some of that, you know. And so you pull off the exit, because the signs were there. There's stuff here, right? And you, I hate it when you pull off the exit and then they tell you the rest of the story. Oh, it's 10 miles that way. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that should be illegal. <laughs> they should have a law against that. You know, it's terrible. But here's the cool thing about it is that Jesus, he did miracles, but those miracles of healing the sick, those miracles of changing water to wine and, uh, and those miracles of walking Walking on water, those miracles of casting out demons, those miracles of raising people from the dead, they were signs of a life that was inside of him. It was the supernatural life that God planted inside of the womb of Mary so that God could come and dwell among us as one of us. That he took his divinity and clothed himself with humanity. He put on the humanity of Jesus Christ like clothing. So that if, you, if for some reason Jesus were to get his arm chopped off, God still dwelled in him, in his spirit. Do you know what? If your arm gets chopped off, that's not your, that's not your person, is it? That's your arm, right? Uh, if you lose your mind, you're still in there, <laughs> ain't you? Some of you are like, well, I hope so, because I lost it yesterday. <laughs> There's something deeper about each one of us. And here's, if you whittle down, what did they do? They killed Jesus' body. They tortured him bodily, and they were trying to get into his mind, weren't they? They were trying to get into his heart. They were trying to get him discouraged and just say, Okay, I'm done. I, I forget it. You know, all I did was heal you guys. All I did was bless you guys and love you guys and forgive you guys. And this is all I get. You lie about me. You turn your government on me. My best friend, one of my best friends, sold me out for 30 pieces of silver, blah, blah, blah. And you, Forget you. You know, Jesus didn't get his feelings hurt. He didn't walk around pouty and defeated and upset. Why? Because even though there was stuff going on in his body, what had the grip upon his soul, upon his mind, was something more powerful than you and I are born with. It was called the spirit of his father dwelling in him. 
Amen? That he, as a man, his human spirit was drawing life from something more than his body. His life was not found in this world. His life had its origins. That life that was planted inside the womb of Mary existed from before the foundations of the world. That is the highest form of life there is. Before God said, let there be light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen? That there's, the, there's this divine mystery that God has a divine nature that doesn't depend on anything outside of itself. You and I, man, we stop breathing, you know, our physical life perishes. We stop eating, be good for a little bit. <laughs> Might get a little cranky, I don't know, you know. But you stop drinking water, stop eating, eventually you stop giving this physical body what it requires. It depends on stuff. Even emotionally, we're wired in such a way that we need love, don't we? We, we, need, some, we need truth, we need wisdom. Our hearts, our minds, we're meant to... We're, we're all dependent on things. And the problem is, is that we've come into this world cut off from the Spirit of God. Cut off from what we were supposed to contain. We were supposed to have the divine nature inside of us. But God, in His love and in His mercy, humbled Himself to come back into, into our humanity in Jesus Christ. He didn't abandon us and say, you know, forget that planet. I've got galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. We're going to start over over here, make another blue ball. And, you know, there's dust over here. I'll just form it into a shape of a man and go just take two humanity take two right because this humanity was spoiled it became corrupt something got into it that wasn't supposed to get into it because God gave us the freedom to make choices didn't we and what did we do? We became deceived and we bowed the knee to his enemy. Instead of taking dominion, instead of walking by faith, instead of believing in God. And so we've all kind of come in into this world corrupt, we, with feelings that we, that we don't, you know, that it just it would seem normal. If I, if I just for no reason just slap Richard across the face, you guys would be like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? But what happened to Jesus? What happened to Jesus? Jesus came the very Creator God who did nothing but love us and bless us and heal us and set us free. And people are slapping Him because it's their job? You know? It makes them feel good. It's crazy, the sort of stuff that happened. So, the problem is, how many of you have ever done something, you're like, gosh, why did I do that? Why did I say that? You know, you, we, 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 we hurt the ones that we love the most with things that we say, things that we do, things that we shouldn't do. We violate love. I mean, does anybody not realize that it would be, the world would be a much happier place? Your home would be a happier place. You would be a happier person if you could just love. Just love. Is just tell the truth. Don't be greedy. Be generous. Everybody knows that's the way to live. But something is inside of every single one of us that is keeping us bound. You know, does any Christian not know that the best way for us to live would be to be bold? Be strong, be courageous, be fearless, be generous, be, uh, you know, let the love of Christ just flow out. But yet I start speaking about, and tomorrow we're actually going to do something. And I could just feel the tension come into the room. <laughs> what, what do you mean? You know what it is? 
It's that same thing that makes us want to retaliate. It's that same thing that makes us think about ourselves first. It's that same thing that destroys our marriage. It's that same thing. So listen, the things that we're talking about here, I want to let you know that there's a lot at stake for you. There's a lot at stake in your homes. There's a lot at stake in your regions. And it's so important because the things that that God commands, they're good for us. Amen? They're good for us. They're really good for us. Uh, The commands of God are not burdensome. Love God and love your neighbor like yourself. Well, gosh, God, you're always telling us what to do. (laughs) You know, it's like grandpa saying, kids, get in the car because I'm taking you to Walmart. And as soon as we get there, I want you to go to the toy store and pick your three favorite toys and meet me right at the front. Grandpa, you're always telling us what to do. (laughs) Nobody does that. Why? Because you understand that the commands are good, right? They're exciting. So listen, the commands of God are not burdensome. God is not trying to, to, to squeeze all the juice out of you to make your life burdensome. I'll tell you what's burdensome is trying to live the American dream and add Jesus to it. Yes. And try to keep him at arm's length and keep him on the side. I'm telling you, it's not working. I have so many people come up to me, pray for my kids. Yeah. Well, well, I gotta get this. I gotta take this promotion that's gonna make me work fifteen hours a, a day, six days a week. Take me out of town two weeks out of every month. I've got to do that for my kids. Really, or for your ego? See, I ain't, I ain't worried about you know. How can I say this? I know there's times where there's seasons. Man, you got to put pedal to the metal. You got to make sacrifices. You got to work hard. I'm not against that. There's times you get caught up in situations. You know, you got to do what you got to do to put bread on the table. I understand that. But there's times, you know, as men, we have the hardest time keeping things in balance because the world, you know what it wants to do? It wants to suck the life out of us. If you've got talent, if you've got skills, if you've got moxie, you know, if you got if you got some stuff, there's some CEO who's got you on his org chart who wants to squeeze every last little drop out of you. And so you've got to understand where your values lie. You've got to understand what's important. Now I know it seems like I'm sort of skipping around, but I'm going somewhere. Okay. I hope you don't mind. Sometimes it, it sort of feels a little bit like I've got a pot or a little bowl up here, and I've got this ingredient. I get that, and I chop some up and throw it in. And then I'm over here to this ingredient, chop some up and throw that in. Don't worry, we're going to put it in the oven, and you're going to see there's something going on here, okay? Because what we got taken captive by was, something, was someone who wants to suck the life out of us. And what did he do? He showed us this little shiny thing. And he put it in the hand of his beautiful woman. And we keep having all these things. They're just so shiny. And they're usually in the hand of a beautiful woman. Ain't they? And he keeps ch- getting us men chasing it. If I could just do that. You know... If, it's not just the car. It's that, look at the girl driving the car. Like, you know, when the guy drives the car on the commercial, the girls all go, wow. You know, when, when the, when, did, do you ever notice, you know, it's not just the guys are playing good music up on the, on, the, on the stage. It's all the girls that you hear going, ah, you're so cute. You know, it's not just that the guys win the trophy. It's that the girls are going, ah. You know, there's something about trying to get our eyes. We're seeking glory. We're seeking affirmation. We're seeking a sense of you're important that, uh, that people are looking for that we would have had rightly from God. Because we were created for what? For glory. We were created for glory. Romans chapter 3 verse 323 for all have sinned and fall short of the, the glory of God. 
Do you know what that means? That means that we fell from where we were supposed to be. When God created you and He created me, He created us to live in His glory. He created us to be filled with His glory. And and we're chasing other people. We're chasing attainments. We're chasing all of these things called the American dream. And you know, there's girl, there's there's lady versions of it, there's guy versions of it, there's uh, um, there's young people versions of it. You know, there's, there's you know, 45, uh, you know, cool. And there's 15-year-old cool. And there's 65-year-old cool. You know, there's all kinds of versions of, of all of this stuff. And it seems like the enemy's always trying to keep us focused on some little shiny thing or some relationship or some connection that is going to be our source of happiness that is going to be our source of life for our souls. Our source of comfort. Our source of security. And God came into this world with none of it. Jesus had life from His Father. He didn't depend upon you and me and how we thought of Him or how we treated Him to be His source of peace. Do you know the last night, those guys are still arguing in Luke's Gospel. They're still arguing over who's the greatest. They're still arguing, you know. They're in the presence of Almighty God. And they're worried about who has the highest rank as number two. Now, how often does it come down to that? Power plays in relationships. Who's got the the hierarchy? Who's got the status behind them? I remember when I first got married, forgive me, okay? My favorite verse was, wives submit to your husbands. (laughs) That was my favorite verse. It was going to be my life verse. I was going to cross stitch that on a pillow, you know, and just rest my head on it every night. And... Bless Tina's heart. God did not give me a wife who is naturally submissive. (laughs) I thank God for it too. Uh, I remember after about a year, I remember thinking, you know, the only thing that stands between us and a perfect marriage was all the things that she needed to change. I was very self-centered. I didn't even realize it. I was blind to it. Because here's the thing about it. Is that sometimes Bible verses will blind you to your own faults and your own selfishness. You think that you've got God on your side in this whole thing. But the truth of it is, you're acting out of that selfishness. That same thing. Hey, I'm following Jesus. Who's the greatest? Yeah. Who gets to have their way when we get in a disagreement? Give me some rank, Jesus. So, so that I can be the boss and just get my way. How's being the boss work in the church? It don't work, does it? You, you, you know, when's the last time you go, I'm the pastor, and everybody just scatters like, yes, sir, you know? <laughs> it, you know, th- there's, there's people that try it. It never works, you know? How, how does it work as a husband going, you're supposed to submit to me. When's the last time that worked? They'll, It didn't work. Why? Because that's not in the life of God. And the wives know it. And the wives know it. Right? I remember God straightened me out about it. And He said, He said, young man, that verse wasn't even written to you. Just cross it out of your Bible. It says, wives, you're not a wife. See, I was interpreting that verse as, husbands, make sure your wives submit to you. <laughs> but it doesn't say that, does it? No. That's between the women and the men. And, and, and their God, isn't it? Amen. It's got nothing to do with us. We just forget about that verse. It's got nothing to do. God didn't say a thing to you or me about it. But do you know something else? There's some verses that talk to husbands. Husbands, lay, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I was like, you know, I was enamored with the fact, I'm the spiritual leader of this home. You know, which I interpreted to mean, if we have a disagreement, God's on my side. Right? Because I have rank. But do you know God not giving husbands and wives rank? He's not ranking us. 
Do you know that? He made us one. That's right, man. So which, which part of the one ranks over the one? I mean, it doesn't work. One over one equals one, right? <laughs> right? So how does this work? Husbands get to be the spiritual leaders of the home. Do you know what spiritual leadership was for Jesus? He went to the cross for the bride. He was the first one to give his rights up. He was the first one to give up his rights. And so many times we get Bible verses we think that are on our side, and we forget that the life of Christ is what saves us from our life. Now, we need that, don't we? I realized God was saying to me, do you know what? You want to be a spiritual leader? Stop trying to win arguments and be the first one to give up. Be the first one to give up your way. Be the first one to say, I'm sorry. Be the first one to acknowledge your faults. Be the first one to look for a way that you can bless and benefit the other one. And stop clinging to selfishness. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean that you... Uh, Never have any input. Doesn't that sound scary? The men, the men some, one, one, I got one I, amen out of the whole group here. And the rest of y'all guys like, could you move on to miracles and signs and wonders? <laughs> but I, I'm going here for a reason. And it's this, because oftentimes we're really ambitious uh, for spiritual things. And sometimes I come into situations... Uh, that relationships are way out of order. They're out of order in the home. They're out of order in the church. And, and part of what gets things worse out of order is when Christians get Bible verses <laughs> that prove that somebody else is out of order. Yeah. Right? And so we start, uh, we start, uh, you know, we got, we go into these things and we can't even hear God because all we're trying to hear is another Bible verse that's going to affirm me right where I'm at and prove where everybody else is wrong. And I want to let you know that God is not going to affirm selfishness. He's not going to affirm the American dream. He's not going to affirm us staying in our comfort zone because the life that Jesus had is the life that He gives to us. He died for us. He lived the life that He puts inside of us. And the thing that grieves me is that very often... The people of God, they want God to bless them. They want to use God and leverage God. Jesus, who's the greatest? They want to get Jesus on their side to give them a Bible verse. Remember Martha coming out from the kitchen? Lord, I've been working really hard for you in the church that you brought into my home. My sister is sitting there doing nothing. Right? And so she's trying to tell Jesus to do his job. <laughs> do your job. And then what did Jesus do? He did his job. Yeah. He said, Martha, Martha, young lady, you're out of order. You're worried. You're anxious. You're upset about so many things. And you're trying to get me on your team to fix all the stuff that you're worried about. And the only way to fix it is to hit it head on and to say, those things are not important to me. Those things are not important to me. What's important to me is what Mary's doing, is being at my feet so I can pour into her. And what I'm pouring into her, there's no man that can take away. There's no man that can take away. So it's really important. Why do I say this? Turn in your Bibles. I'm, this was all introduction. So if you not, he's not preaching about, I was just doing the introduction. Y'all just relax a little bit. Uh, Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five, and verse eight is where we'll start. It says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for this, for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, 
much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. Now, this is an amazing verse. This is part of what I want you to see, okay? When I first came to know Jesus, the gospel that I heard over and over and the gospel that still prevails in the church is this idea that God sent Jesus merely to get our record uh, uh, cleansed from the guilt of sin so that when we stand before Him through the blood of Jesus, we can, we, we can stand there spotless and amazed and enter into the, the glory of heaven. And there's some truth there, but it's incomplete. And how many of you know that sometimes an incomplete truth is a bold-faced lie? Amen? Because if you just tell people part of the truth, the parts that you left out, the question is, why did you leave them out? Maybe therein is the deception. And over and over, I feel like... Uh, we're sort of reinforcing something uh, in the church culture in America that leaves people open to deception because we become a deception to one another. When, when, when part of what Jesus is, when he approached people, he said, follow me, follow me. You know, that was Jesus' gospel. Follow me and I will give you life. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Come follow me if you want to be my disciple. Amen? So if you believe, then continue on in my word. Amen? So let my word abide in you. So there was, there was none of this, believe in me, and you get to go to heaven when you die. Yeah. But if, and the rest of it is pretty much optional. Just take your pick. If it enhances your lifestyle, if it fixes your spouse or your boss or your church, but doesn't mess with you, because we don't really need to go there. Jesus didn't do that, did he? He didn't do that at all. He said, follow me. That's what discipleship is. It's a belief that, you know what? I've been going the wrong way. I've been living without God. And God has now showed up on the planet. And I need not only to have my record uh, changed so that I'm spotless before God, but I need to be changed. Don't just change my record. Change me. Amen? Now, that's what this, this, that's what this says is that much more than having now been justified through His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God for Him, through Him. So here's a cool thing about it, is that the blood of Jesus doesn't just wipe out your past record. It wipes out everything, your whole record, much more than having been justified. So we're already justified. God looks at you and He says, okay, you are completely just and right. Some people say like this, that it's just as if I've never sinned. But it's more than that. It's just as if you did everything right. It's not just that you didn't do anything wrong, but God treats you as if you've done absolutely everything He requires. Absolutely everything. Why? Because when Jesus lived, when He came onto this planet, how old was that little baby in the manger? Okay. I got one says a newborn. Anybody else have a different answer? How old was when Jesus was laid in that manger, how old was he? Before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. There we go. So which one's right? Her or him? Both. Both. That's right. Amen. Right? Good. Well, you get to keep your job. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) That's right. Absolutely. Because he was in his humanity, he was an infant, but there there was a life inside of him that existed before the foundations of the world. Now, let me ask you, which life made him awesome? It was the life that he brought into that body, right? Which life was his identity? 
It was the one that he had before the foundations of the world, right? And so his humanity became a container and a place of display. His humanity was filled with this life that he had before the foundation of the world. But guess what? Is it just that he had it and now he left it all aside? No, he still got it inside of him. Amen? Yes. Isn't that cool? So now he's living by that life. And when he's, but he's doing it in a humanity, right? So here's the cool thing about it his human life is attached to your human life, my human life. Do you know how? Now, think of it this way. In Colossians, it says that He upholds all things by the word of His power. It says that when God created all things, He created all things in Christ. Right? So there was not like... Sometimes I imagine this way, you know, that God stepped to the edge of nothing. And He said, let there be light. And there was light. There was nothing, but now there's light. That's not how it worked. There was no nothing. God was all. God was all. God was all. So the Father put the creation in Christ. And Christ upholds all things by the word of His power. And this one stepped in to His creation. Okay? In human, in human form. Now... I want to tell you guys something really cool. You guys know that they, they made that little that Ark Encounter replica in Kentucky? I was on the original Ark, and they got a couple things wrong. <laughs> I'm serious. I was on the original Ark. You were too. Don't believe me? How many of y'all would be here if that Ark would have sunk? <laughs> right? That, if that ark sinks, how many of you guys would be here? Why? Because every single one of us was on, on that ark. Do you understand that? Inside of Noah, or Shem, or Japheth, or the other guy. There you go. <laughs> Smart people in this church. Good job, Pastor. <laughs> I'll give him all the credit for that answer. Anyway, so, listen. We're inside of them. That's right. We're inside of Him. So when Noah moves from the old creation to the new creation, we came into the new creation with Him, didn't we? Because we were inside of Him when He was on that ark. Listen, when Jesus Christ came into this world, He instantly became the oldest human being who ever lived. So just the same way that you and I were inside of Adam, when Adam was taken captive, you and I were taken captive inside of Him, boom, the last Adam has arrived. The last Adam has arrived, and you and I are inside of him. And the last Adam lives a perfectly righteous life, and you and I are inside of him. That's good. That's good. Yeah? And he goes to the cross, and when he was crucified, guess who was inside of him? Guess who got crucified with Christ? Yeah, see, it wasn't just your sins. He didn't just die for your sins. He did, but He died as you, containing you, representing you. And so when, you, when, when God was crucifying Jesus Christ, He was crucifying the old, corrupt humanity. And then when God raised Jesus Christ, Jesus was victorious. But in Him is our victory. When He was raised, He was raised for our justification. God was saying, you made them right with me. You made them just with me. And so when you believed on Jesus, Jesus justified you. Amen? How much more will the blood of Jesus save us from the wrath that's to come? Amen? How much more? How much more? Praise God. All right? Now, when you called on the name of the Lord Jesus, something amazing happened. You got born again. 
That doesn't just mean that your sins got forgiven. It does mean your sins got forgiven. The blood of Jesus wiped them away. All this stuff about the blood of Jesus justifying you, that doesn't touch you. That's all outside of you. That's all happening in the eyes of God. He's taking the realities of what Jesus has done and He's applying that to your account. So He's taking all of your debt and Jesus pays it. But not only does He pay your debt, I mean, if you've had creditors after you, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, right? But if you've had creditors after you, it's good to have like no more debt. Amen? But it's better to be rich. You know, like to to be back to a zero balance, that's pretty cool. But here's the thing. He's saying he doesn't just bring you back to a zero balance. He justifies you. He justifies you. He says all of the richness as if you've worked 100% every day of your everlasting life is to your account now. Praise God. Not only does he, not only does he give you forgiveness, You're not even close to the wrath of God. How much more? God doesn't just want to not punish you. God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. He wants to, He wants to, He wants to give you His fullness. Now, verse 10, for while we were enemies, while if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now this is cool. Now reconciliation, that's a relationship word. It just just doesn't mean the judge says, Okay, congratulations, you get to go free, keep your citizenship. This is... Give me a hug. (laughs) That's that thing that happens, you know, when the husband and the wife, they were at odds with each other, and finally things get solved. And then it's the hug and the kiss and the the making up. It's like things are back together. Amen? And that's nice when there's reconciliation. I tell people, I said, there's a difference biblically between forgiveness and reconciliation. Sometimes you need to forgive people that you can't reconcile with. Why? Because reconciliation has, will require more. It requires them to change. Right? But you can forgive people that aren't willing to repent. You can forgive people that are dead. You can't be reconciled to them. Do you understand? So there's sometimes you forgive people, but listen, if your boyfriend cheated on you, you can forgive him. You need to. Amen. Doesn't need, mean you need to go back with him. Right. He still might be a womanizer. Or even if he's not, maybe it's just better that y'all both go your separate ways. You see the difference? This, God reconciled us. God reconciled us. He brought us back into a relationship. He created us for a relationship. Do you know the first thing that Adam saw was the face of God drawing back from a kiss. He was wiping dirt off his mouth. Everything that's in me becomes your life. The humility of God to put His lips on dirt. But you know what? That be- Adam became a living soul. It's amazing. He created the container. Something that corresponded to his nature that can contain God. You know, and there's a way in which that saves us. But listen, look at the rest of this verse. Having been reconciled. Do you know that's really important? I just want to say sometimes y'all step in it. You know why I know that? Sometimes I step in it. Okay? But here's the deal. Do you ever... I grew up Catholic. When Catholics commit a sin, they're supposed to go to confession. If you confess your sin, the priest gives you what? Penance. Right? You're supposed to do something to make it up to God. You know? Say extra prayers, these kind of things. Do you understand that there's some things you can't make up to God? 
There's nothing you can make up to God. The blood of Jesus reconciled you to God. You have, you have been reconciled. And so there's nothing that you do that make it up to God. There's nothing. God never turns His heart against you. He's always for you. Um, I like to say it this way. My kids are homeschooled. And they can't fail anything. They can't fail math, science, English, spelling. They can't. They might just repeat it over and over and over. Uh, but we're just not going to stop teaching them. It's our job to make them successful. Do you understand? So we don't get upset at them. We don't get discouraged with them. We just keep pouring into them and we help them become successful. And until they demonstrate mastery, we don't move forward. Do you know God's like that? You know, if, if you don't get it, that's all right. He's got it. And He's not upset. He's not bothered. He's not turning His heart against you. He's not frustrated. Do you know what? You're justified. By the blood of Jesus. You're reconciled by the blood of Jesus. But He's doing something. He's actually saving you by the life of Christ. Now here's the thing. This, this is all what I was going to. Why? Because what is the life of Christ? What does this mean? Having reconciled us. That we have a relationship that's there. We have a standing that's there. We're been, we've been justified. But all of that is there. And so that we can experience something really personal. And internal, having been reconciled, having been justified, that's not a relationship or a standing that we want to abuse. And for so many years, I was taught my identity in Christ in such a way that's kind of like psychologies. You know, God sees you this way, even though you know you're not. God sees you this way, even though you know you're not. And so it began to feel fake. It began to feel empty. It felt like God and I were praying pretend with Bible verses. God says I'm good, that I'm righteous, that I'm holy, but I stink. I'm messing it up. You know, I don't want to just be forgiven. I want to be changed. I want to be brand new. I don't want to, I don't want to walk in addiction. I don't want to walk in selfishness. I don't want to walk in fear and anxiety. I, I don't want Him just feeling good about me. And me feeling miserable about me. Do you understand? And that's and so people would come at me with, well, you just need to learn your identity in Christ. And I'm like, I'm going over the verses. I'm committing them to memory. Where's the connection? Where's it supposed to kick in? How does it change me? And listen... He doesn't just reconcile us and justify us and leave us unchanged. He puts something inside of us. He puts the very life that was before the foundations of the world, that He planted inside the womb of Mary, that empowered the Lord Jesus Christ to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to hear from the Father, to cast out demons, that very life that raised Jesus from the dead, that life that is seated victorious, having gone through everything that hell can throw at a human being on the face of the planet, and sitting there in victory, just total glory, when you called on the name of the Lord Jesus, He saved you and made made you alive together with Christ. He put Christ inside of you so that He can save you. He saves you by the life of Christ. What does He save you from? He saves you from your life. He saves you from living like you so that you can live like Jesus. But not just by telling you to try harder, to, you know, uh, giving you a bunch of Bible verses for you to apply to your life. That's the problem. Your life can't apply Bible verses. <laughs> Your life don't work. Your life is broke. You need a different life, a life that you weren't born with. And that's why it says, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We're saved from my life by His life. Now here's the rub. 
Now it becomes altogether something amazing because He's planted inside of you and inside of me the very Lord of glory. He's And that, to God, has become our identity. That has become the reality of who we are. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says this, When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, you will be revealed with Him in glory. Wow. God says Christ is your life. Christ is your life. Christ is your life. So you know what that means? You're already blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Do you know that everything that pertains to life and godliness is living inside of you so that you can become a partaker of the divine nature? Jesus was partaking of someone else's nature. He was partaking of his Father in his humanity. He was living by the Father's life. And he got that life from outside of space and time from outside of his circumstances, from outside of his own thoughts and feelings. He got that life by faith, by turning his heart to the Father. That's why Jesus, living among us, was happy, was secure, but was loving, generous, wasn't bitter, wasn't overbearing. He didn't compromise either, did he? He simply was who He was because He knew who He was. And He did the Father's will because He knew the Father's will was easy. It's loving God and loving other people. But His love wasn't just mere sentiment. His love was that kind of love that takes on hell to set people free. That's the love that comes with power. It wasn't about keeping rules. And for religious people, that's all it can ever be about. And so they're not content with rules that they can't keep. I mean, those are sentiment. You know, love God, love other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what we're really concerned about is rules that we can keep. And so they start making all these goofy rules. You know, about how much makeup people can wear. About how long their beards can be. You know, about what, whether they can wear blue jeans or not. You know, how late you can stay up. I met a a friend of your brother's down in Kentucky that was kicked out of a church for using a cell phone. Serious. There's churches around here that they'll judge you according to whether your tires have rubber on them or not. No, I I mean, that sounds really ridiculous in, in terms of religion, but I'm telling you, we get our little preferences in a row and we think that God's given us Bible verses so that we can start fussing and fighting and Jesus didn't fuss and fight about any of that. He let it all go. Even when people really disobeyed God, you know what? He wanted them to be reconciled. He wanted them to be reconciled. He treated them like their true worth, their true value. You're worth dying for. You're worth dying for. You're worth dying for. You're worth dying for. for. And that sets us free. Now, In Ephesians, I want to show you this, Ephesians chapter 2. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, it's really cool. Verse 4, or, well... Let me read the whole thing. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. See the problem? We didn't have life. We, had, we were in something else. We weren't in life. We were in trespasses. We were in sins. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So, you know, if you're just going and living like the rest of the world, you're living like a devil. You're living under the control of the devil. And that doesn't just mean, just if you're just living like an average human being, even if you attend church and listen to Christian radio, if you're not living in God to grow into the image of Jesus, there's a deception at work, right? Now, we want to break out of that. Amen? So uh, don't hear me condemning anybody. This is not meant to, you know, you're, you're, you know, 
I'm not that way. I want to set you free, though. But we want to open our eyes here. Average is deadly. Let's don't be average. Let's don't be normal, what the world would call normal. Let's don't be good little churchy Christians. Let's follow Jesus into a brand new life. Among whom we all too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, look at that. Now, it says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Saved from what? Saved from living according to the flesh, according to the prince of the power of the air. See, we make everything about hell. Listen. Hell is the end result of living according to the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, living in deception, living in bondage, living in in the normal lust. The not not just not just I you know I want to have sex all the time. That just normal desires. I want to have uh, you know my dreams fulfilled. I want to have my house. I want to you know that all of my happiness is based in stuff out here. My security is based in stuff out here. But thanks be to God, He saved us. He rescued us. And how did He do this? We, he did it by making us alive together with Christ. Now here's the cool thing about it. There's three Greek words for the word with. Now Paul took... He could have chosen any of the three Greek words for with, and they all have different connotation. The word para, which is like parachurch, it has the idea of, of face to face. And that's the word that, he, that was used in the Gospel of John. The word was with God. The word was face to face with God. Face to face. That's a good word. You know, that would have been cool. There's a word meta that kind of means with, like alongside, you know, dad with his daughter, you know, father and father with his son. And then there's the word soon. Soon is very interesting. So I'm going to have to just speak for a second. So this. Let's say is Jesus Christ. He's come into the world and he's filled with his father, with his father's glory, the royalty and the majesty of his father. Amen? Now, this would be para or with us, God with us, or this would be uh, meta. We're walking with one another, we're doing things together. And many times we think of ourselves as being with God like that. Amen? And that's right. We're with Him like that. But Paul uses the word soon, that God made us alive together with Christ. What does that mean? Do you ever see the movie Frankenstein or read the book? Dr. Frankenstein made, made this monster alive with electricity, right? This is soon. So everything that was in Him, now is poured into us. And so now you don't have us and Christ, but you have us soon. God made us together, alive together with Christ. We're one. We're one life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 17 says that those who belong to Christ are one spirit with Him. It used to be that God was with us. Remember Jesus said that to the disciples. The Holy Spirit has been with you. But now He will be in you. So this is a new kind of with. But the life that is Christ now is not just Christ's life. The Spirit that is, that is now Christ is not just Christ's Spirit. The Spirit of Christ now dwells in our spirit and the two have become fused. We are containers of the living God. See, religion 
is kind of like this. God made us His computer monitors, and we became unplugged through deception. We weren't plugged into anything except ourselves, and a computer monitor unplugged. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but they collect a lot of dust, and you can see all the fingerprints, and they're just, you know, they're just dark. Amen? And so if you go... You know, religion is, let's try to get as much dust and fingerprints off the monitors as we can. But the gospel is, let's get people plugged in. Let's let God fill people again. Let's let God fill people again. And so, here's the thing. We don't want to just change on the outside and say, hey, we're reconciled, we're justified. God calls us an ambassador, even though I never represent Him. Right? We want to become everything that God calls us. We want to walk in everything that God calls us. And there's certain things that are absolutely permanent, that are fixed. But there are other things that God put in us so that we could begin to access it and, uh, and activate it and release it. Amen? And actually walk in it. So here's, that is where the life of Christ, everything that's inside of Him, God put inside of you. The miracle working power, the healing power, the love, the peace, the patience. How many of you have ever asked God, God make me patient? You know, you probably did and then you learned from the rest of the church. That's not a great prayer because you know what he does? Here's God. He says, I need to show them that that's a stupid prayer. Why? Because that's not God's plan. God's plan is not to make you patient. God's plan is to give you Christ with you on the inside. And so he'll throw you into situations that it's absolutely impossible for you in your flesh to bear up. Because the life that's in Christ can bear it. The life that's in Christ that's inside of you can bear it. And so that's amazing. So you have no choice. You know, it feels really hard on your flesh, but on the inside, it's like, okay, God, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And God's like, you wanted to be patient. I'm just trying to show you, you're not, that's not my plan. My plan is to give you Jesus. You know, I mean, even when you seek virtue, God, make me patient. You know, you're just trying to improve yourself. You're trying to give me patience so I can manage my situation. I can be what you want me to be. And God's like, I want you to have Christ. And so if you will just look to Him and find in Him all your love, all your peace, find in Him your joy, your security, you know what? All that stuff that's frustrating you won't bother you so much anymore. Stop trying to find your life in this world. Stop trying to find your joy and your peace and your happiness from all everything going right and people treating you right and all this kind of stuff. That's backwards. Yes, it is. And that's what many of us do. We try to get our church arranged. We try to get our family arranged. We try to get our, our life circumstances and our finances arranged out here. So if they just get arranged right, then I can have everything just the way I need to. Then I can have peace. Then I can have patience. No, that's not the way it is. God makes us alive together with Christ and He saves us from that. He saves us from that mindset so that no matter what's going on on the outside, that we are stable, we are secure, we have life, we have joy. Because I didn't give, I didn't get my identity from anybody around me. I didn't ask you to think good of me. I, I don't need from out here I, because I've laid all that down. Because I know how shallow all that stuff is. That if, if you'll perform for this, guess what? Now you're a slave to it. As soon as they take it away, now you've got to find the hoops they want you to jump through. Amen? And they keep moving the hoops because oftentimes the people, they really don't want you to do anything particular. They just want you to perform for them. It's about control usually. And sometimes it's that way in marriage. Sometimes it's that way in the, in the world situation. But Jesus, very often, He gave Himself up. Now, I know this isn't like a big, big rah-rah sermon. There's a, little bit, there's a little bit more here. Is it, is it okay if I kind of unpack it a little bit more? Yeah. All right. Now, in Philippians chapter 2... I want to show you this. 
because it's really amazing. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind towards one another. All right. Then he says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Right? Consider others more important than yourself. Look to, to them before. And then look what he does in verse 6. He says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, something to be hold on to. So basically, he didn't hold on to all of his rights and privileges. Hey guys, I'm God, you better not say that about me. Right? He didn't act that way. He didn't hold on to his rights, even though he had Bible verses. <laughs> He had Bible verses. He could have gone around proving, look, I'm the Messiah. You guys should just be licking my boots. He had Bible verses. But he wasn't living according to merely Bible verses. He was the Word made flesh. So he's actually demonstrating the nature of God to us. And the nature of God is not holding on to rights and demanding your own way. The nature of God, Jesus wasn't involved in those fights of who's the greatest. He wasn't. The only one who wasn't involved in those fights was Jesus. And He was the greatest. (laughs) And He wasn't even trying to fight for it or prove it. Here's the cool thing about it. When you love your wife the way that you should, it makes makes it easy for her to cooperate with you. It really does. It really does. I found when you become the spiritual leader and understand that rightly, that lead like Jesus did. Lay your life down. Serve. Bless. Be the first one to give up selfishness. It makes it so much easier because for the wife to be the kind of wife that you have always dreamed of. It's amazing. When you start treating other people with love, it makes it easier for them to grow in their relationship with Jesus. We don't grow by badgering one another. That's that Galatians word of be careful that you don't bite and devour each other. That's how the flesh improves. Now, here's the interesting thing. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, those who are on the he- those uh, who are in heaven, those who are on earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of the Father. Here's the deal. God wants to save us from our life, but the pattern of the life of Christ is that we obey God and love others. We obey God and love others. No matter what the cost, we obey God and we love others. And you know what? That releases heaven. That brings spiritual authority. That brings the manifestation of the kingdom in our homes, in our relationships, in our jobs, uh, in our minds, in our hearts. We don't have to... Nobody can keep you from humbling yourself. Nobody can keep you from gaining the spiritual victory. And listen, no matter how far it feels like your flesh is being put down, guess what? God will exalt you. God will lift you up. God will release His power and His kingdom and His authority. And here's the neat thing about this. is oftentimes what keeps us from stepping out and loving other people the way that we ought to is because we've given them so much authority in our minds. We, we care so much about their opinions. We care so much about what people might say. We're, we, we've made everything a pass-fail. What if I pray for them and nothing happens? You know what? God says, you're justified. It's just, I'm going to not treat you any different. You're reconciled. I am still for you. But guess what? The life of Christ is still in you. And Jesus' life doesn't walk up to people. What if nothing happens? So guess what? I'm going to save you from that mindset. I'm going to save you from that mindset. How? You're going you're to focus on what you can control. Obey me. Obey me. Humble yourself. Love other people. Obey me. Humble yourself. Love other people. And you know what? It becomes really simple. Because that is the flow of the river. And it pushes out so much flesh. And it changes the way that we approach the entire world. It changes the way we relate to our children, our jobs, our money, because none of it's ours anymore. 
And I don't need this stuff to go right to make me happy. The pastor can preach a bad sermon. The worship music can suck. The youth minister can be a a freak. And you know what? (laughs) And I'm still happy. Why? Because I don't need those things to make me feel good. I can walk into church and sit down and nobody can talk to me. And you know what? I don't get my feelings hurt because I didn't come there empty. I came there with the life of Christ. I didn't come there for myself. I came there to consider others, to consider others, to glorify God, to love other people. When I went out, I wasn't looking for, you know, opportunities because I needed these opportunities so that I could live out my faith and and, and prove to everyone around me that Jesus is still doing miracles because, you know, I just need to get the church to grow. It wasn't anything like that. That person's hurt and God loves them. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I'm not trying to prove anything. Every time Jesus, every time people came up to Jesus and said, hey, show us a sign. Prove it, hot shot. Jesus never did it. That's right. Never did. And is it any wonder when we put all this pressure on ourselves to prove it, that it don't work? Wow. Isn't that funny? So listen, some of the, part of this whole thing is, you know, last year I was here and I spent, you know, a few days, you know, kind of like we're doing now, to equip you to walk in the kingdom. But, you know, it, you kind of take those initial lessons and then you go out, you know, the, the seed gets planted in the soil and, you know, then it gets tested. Amen? The sun comes out. <sighs> How you feel now? You know? <laughs> and then the worries of life come in. You know? How many, how many people's schedule after that conference just went berserk? You know? It was like, you know, all kinds of things tried to crowd in. And we have to decide, whoever tries to save his life, you want your life? Eventually, you will lose it. But if you want to have my life, give your life, lose your life, lose your life, lose your life for me and the gospel, and you'll find it. You want to find this life, you want to live by this life, you lay everything down. You lay everything down. You lay everything down. And don't be afraid. Because it's a scary thing. But God knows when you lay your life down, what you're doing is laying your life down to take up the life of Christ. I don't want my life anymore. I don't care about me. Look, I got crucified. It's me that's keep messing everything up. Me caring for me. Amen? But when you know God's love for you, then it gives you a right sense of dignity, a right sense of worth. Right? So I'm, so I'm a little bit concerned because sometimes people are in abusive situations, even in their marriage, and it's private, and people don't know. And listen, I've told, I've told wives sometimes to say, listen, God is not on the side uh, of your husband continuing to treat you the way he's treating you. So... One way or the other, either you need to pack your bags or he needs to pack his, but this has got to stop and you've got to have some real change go on inside of him. And he's got to be willing to do that. And we can talk about, you know, or your pastor and you can talk about how the best way to proceed with that. So listen, it doesn't mean just being a doormat and being in an abusive situation that is keeping uh, you. Remember when Jesus was hit? Jesus didn't just take it, did he? He said, why did you do that? Right? He wasn't reacting selfishly either. Because he said, if I did wrong, bear witness of the wrong. Otherwise, why did you do it? Right? So he was trying to get that guy to say, think about what you're doing, buddy. Think about what you're doing. He carried on. Because he had to go to the cross. But he went to the cross to set us free. Now, how many of you have laid hands on somebody or you started walking, taking this walk. Okay, I want to walk like Jesus. Listen, I I want to tell you where the walk starts. It starts that your life is Christ's life. And it starts in the presence of God where it's always been. 
It starts being a son, fully reconciled, fully loved. That life is a life that gets its life from the Father. This is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. This is life. I find life for my soul in Christ, in the presence of the Father, as a son. Because you are sons, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You want to experience the life of Christ? It starts not out on the streets, but it starts in the prayer closet. It starts in your heart, being in the presence of God, loving God, loving God, not just agreeing with this verse, but actually living in the presence of God with your heart on fire, just worshiping God. And it doesn't have to be a bunch of fancy words. It doesn't have to have a bunch of fancy music, but it just starts turning your heart to God. I love you, Father. I worship you. I remember when somebody taught me, just go and worship God. Be Just get alone and just start praising Him and thanking Him with all your might. Amen. Just th- turn your heart to Him and thank Him and praise Him with all your might. I love you, Father. You are so good. I praise you that you've set me free. And don't be there thinking about yourself. And You're a son. He's he's looking at you as it, with the, all the affection that he has in Christ. But you've got to learn how to tap into that and express that. And it's amazing to me how many people I know have been Christians their whole life. Then you go over to their house and they want you to pray for the meal. I'm like, man, that's a shame that people are uncomfortable actually expressing their hearts to God. It's our very nature. God is wants to save you from that distance of just living for God and attending church and feeling like you got to get the pastor to do anything spiritual. That's why we're losing our kids. Because they're tired of getting drugs somewhere that doesn't make a difference in their parents' life. And He wants to save parents from their life by giving you the life of Christ. Amen? Amen? So don't take it like my, my, my standing with God depends on my ability to tap into the life. Look, the standing is set. You're justified. He's reconciled you. And having been reconciled, how much more do you get saved by the life of Christ? What do you get saved from? You get saved from living according to the prince of the power of the air. Go read the last part of Acts chapter 2. It says that they said, And with many other exhortations, the apostles kept exhorting them, Save yourselves, not from hell, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Come out from living in the selfishness and darkness and emptiness of life without God. Come and find life in God. And you can do this. And and then you take God into your workplace. Then you take God into the restaurants. Then you take God grocery shopping. Because you are together alive with the life of Christ. It's not you grocery shopping anymore. It's Jesus grocery shopping. He's wearing you as His body. Amen? Amen. It's not you raising children anymore. It's Jesus raising children inside of you. He's putting His mind in your mind, His heart in your heart. But you've got to start with turning your heart to God. Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Turn in your heart to the Father. Because Jesus found His life the same way place He's always found it for all eternity. Face to face in the presence of the Father. They needed nothing outside themselves. They, God did not make this world because He was emotionally needy. Right. And He's not looking to you to make Him happy. That's right. He's, no kid can live with that kind of pressure. But the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I'm telling you, this is the cool thing. This is what sets you free so that you can actually have that hot nuclear reactive core that you're carrying around on the inside that gives you the power to live an amazing Christian life. Because the Christian life, in terms of touching other people, 
What touches them is not your efforts to make a difference for Jesus. What touches them is that life coming out from you and touching them. When they hear uh, the voice of God coming out from you, when they hear, when they see the love of God, when they feel the truth of God, when they feel the love of God uh, and the power of God touching their lives... That's what makes the difference. And so here's the cool thing. Instead of judging yourself like, well, I've been trying, you know, I've been laying hands and I'm not seeing a whole lot of results. And, you know, here's the cool thing. Look at the beginning of Philippians chapter 2. If there's any encouragement in Christ, forget what might be discouraging you. If there's any encouragement, focus on that. And so many times we start these little babies, we, we hear these messages like, okay, great, I'm going to go live the Jesus life. And then we get out there and the seed's planted, then the sun comes out, starts testing us, right? Things, you know, we're going to, okay, you know, we're going to do this, we're going we're gonna to minister to people wherever we go. And then things start happening, and then we start feeling a little discouraged, but we got to stop focusing on what we're not seeing and train our eyes to look where we do see Christ, where we do find encouragement, where we do see the Spirit of God, where we do see evidence of His work. I remember one time my son, he came home. Um, this was several years back when he was first starting to walk in this. My, my son had gone with my wife shopping at Walmart. And they came in, and I think I was writing a book because I remember being in the chair, and I was watching him sort of nervously, nervous energy. You know, you can kind of tell when your kids don't seem settled within themselves when they're usually walking in peace. My sons, my children do. So he's kind of a little, you know, just fidgety. I said, son, everything okay? He goes, well, no, well, when, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's like, all right, well, what is it? And I said, he said, uh, dad, when I was at Walmart, um, I saw three people who needed prayer. And I said, really? What'd you do? And he said, well, the first guy, he was in one of those little carts, and I walked up to him, and, and I said, hi. And then, uh, and then he said, hi back, and, and then I kept walking. <laughs> but, but I prayed for him in my heart. And he said, does that count? I said, do you feel like it's a full release of what God put in your heart? And he said, no, not really. See, it's not about pass-fail, does it count? See, we're not ha- we don't have a count, doesn't count column. We just have the life of Christ. Is that, and so there was some Christ there, right? And so what I did is I looked for that and I said, Hey, don't be discouraged, buddy. Look, you saw a need and you moved towards it. And even if you didn't fully do everything in you that addressed the need, at least you're seeing it. You're seeing it. We can work with that. Amen? So if there's any encouragement, find that. Yeah. Amen? And, and, and what do you do when there's a bunch of weeds and, and, uh, in your flower garden? Do you, do you rip out the flowers because they're not supposed to be in the weeds? No. You look for the flowers. Amen? Amen. And then you can pull the weeds. Well, this, time, this way, so many times, like, I'm so discouraged. There's so many weeds in my garden. There's flowers. Don't mow the thing up. There's flowers. Right? It's not a worthless garden. Remember, even Jesus, he said, you know, that, that there, was, there was wheat and there was tares. I didn't tear up the wheat. And you know the reason that, he's, that, that this world is getting darker and darker because he's allowing the wheat to grow up. God has sowed sons of God on the face of the planet. He sowed a son as a seed. Jesus is the seed of the Father so that he could reap mature sons. And he's put Christ inside of you and there's a growing up process. Amen? Amen. But it's nice when we know the process. So that's what this whole weekend is going to be about. It's not just going to be about learning your identity, but it's going to go to that next level of how do you walk in it? What do you do when you find these barriers that try to pull us off and get us off track? It's not just going to be a rah-rah thing of let's go out and evangelize the world. It's let God get so hold of us that we've let go of our life. Because we did when we received Him, didn't we? We did when we received Him, but we have that daily choice. Paul said, I die daily. Death works in me. Why? So that life can work in you. 
Amen? And so we have that choice at any given moment. What are we going to hold on to? Where are we going to find, seek our satisfaction, our happiness, our sense of, of self? Is it in all these things going right? Or have I let all that go and found it in Christ? And let Him be my all in all. Now He's not just the all. Now He's the all in all. He wants to fill you. He wants to be soon with you. He wants to be your life, be your mind, be your heart, be your all. So I know what it's like, you know, when you lay hands on somebody and you don't see them recover instantly in front of your eyes. I know what it's like to see them recover too. And you know what I do? If there's any encouragement, that's what I focus on, right? Otherwise, the other stuff will try to stop you. It'll try to stop you. It'll try to tell you, well, there's something wrong with you. Well, you know what? You, at least you're stepping out and doing things now that are like Christ. Yeah. Amen? So why don't we just keep humbling ourselves? Forget about us. Yeah. Let's obey God. Let's obey God. Let's love other people. It's not about us. It's about them getting healed and me obeying God. That's right. Yeah, it's about them. Uh, it's about me treating them like Jesus wants to treat them and me obeying God. And guess what? You keep humbling yourself, what's going to happen? God will will exalt you. He will manifest the King of kings and the Lord of glory through your life. You just keep focusing on where there's any encouragement. You keep focusing on where there's any life. And that will allow those flowers to grow. It will allow you to grow up into a mature wheat. Amen? Amen. So let me share just a, a couple of stories that will help you, I think, kind of illustrate this. I remember one time I was doing a conference, and there was one guy that uh, he said, Can I go with you? And I said, Sure. You know, we kind of do that. And so we went out to lunch, and, and on the way over there, he said, I don't know how this is going to go for me. I'm an introvert. And I said, Oh, really? I said, What Bible verse did you get that from? <laughs> and he said, What do you mean? And I said, Well, I, I'm, what I'm saying is, did God tell you you're an introvert so he's not sure this is going to work for you? Or is that you telling me what seems right to a man that leads to death? And he, and he said, I guess it's the second one. <laughs> and I said, yeah, so what? But then, he's, then he wants to reason out. But, you know, not everybody can be outgoing and extroverted. And I'm, you know, I'm an engineer and, you know, my socks don't match and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, he says, I don't like to talk to people. I said, well, who cares? Who cares what you like? Who cares about that? What matters is not that. What matters is, are you going to hold on to that as your identity? If, if so, you try to save your life, that's what's going to happen. But if you deny yourself, if you forget about you, that's what humble yourself means. Forget about you. Forget about how you feel. Forget about what you think your limitations are. That's not something you learn from God. That's something you learn from Oprah Winfrey. Right? That's something you learn from Psychology's America. Uh, how about you learn the gospel so that you can uh, say, okay, whatever my personality is, Jesus wants to flow through me. Amen. He, wants, he wants to flow through me, so it might look a little different. Well, guess what? The next day, he came back. He was so excited. He said, I laid hands on three people today. Two of them got healed. The other person got saved. He says, I decided I am not an introvert. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Amen. Who doesn't like to be around people. <laughs> but I love doing this. And uh, I remember uh, recently I went to Winnipeg and I met uh, a brother there who actually does has a ministry very similar to this he travels around the world uh, but Winnipeg is his home base and so when we broke up he came to my conference I was just really humbled and I was looking forward to get to know him so when we broke up I got on his team so I could chat with him and uh, we were going to his stomping grounds and he knew all about how to reach Native Americans uh, because there's a lot of them uh, out on the streets in Winnipeg and he showed me some really fun things it was just just great hanging around him uh, um, he he does this goofy little magic trick thing where he'll 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 walk up to a, a group of people and he'll take a napkin and say, "Hey guys, you want to see something really cool? Uh, watch, look at this napkin right here, okay?" And then and then he'll say, "Okay, now which of you has any like a blind eye, a deaf ear, or has pain in their body?" And you know he'll go around and he'll get everybody's conditions. And he'll say, "Now watch this, okay?" Whew. 
Okay, now, you had something, you grab it, now pass it to them, pass it to them, right? And they say, all right, now you hold on to it. Now, when I snap my fingers at the, in the, in the, uh, on, the, on the count of three, every condition that you had is going to go. One, two, three, boom. And they'll say, now, check your eye, check your ear, check your pain, right? And then somebody's standing there with a wadded up napkin. <laughs> It starts off like a magic trick. It's got nothing to do with that. And then he tells him about Jesus. It's really cool. And so he draws a little crowd doing that. He's, he's just, the, I don't know how he thought of that. That was pretty brilliant, I thought. Because Native Americans at that stage, because of some of the cultural baggage, they're not really open to all the time for people walking up to him and saying, hey, I want to talk to you about Jesus. Well, you're a white man and you want to talk about Jesus. Bad history there, right? Prejudice. So he gets them healed and then talks to him about Jesus. And he does it goofy. <laughs> and I loved it. I thought it was great. Then I met his wife. And his wife loves Jesus too. But his wife is not the outgoing, I'm going to walk up and try to draw a crowd. His wife shared with me, though, when her husband really began to get a hold of this, you know, he wanted to be out doing this all the time. He owned several businesses, and so he just sort of worked it out that he didn't have to be as involved anymore. So he just started living off profits and became a full-time evangelist. That's pretty cool, huh? Uh, that's kingdom finances right there, you know? Uh, and so... He started doing this, and he was getting his wife to come out with him. And she said, you know, I am not a crowd person. And so I was trying to think, you know, at first I felt a lot of pressure on myself. Like, does he expect me to be like him, you know? And here's the cool thing about it. He didn't pressure that. That was her own flesh kicking that in, right? God doesn't expect you to be like somebody else. He wants each one of us to let Jesus save us from our life, our limitations, our hang-ups, our fears, our inhibitions, our limitations. Because guess what? what? Nothing limits love. Nothing limits the love of God flowing through you except your unwillingness to surrender. Okay? Now here's the cool thing about it. She said, I started just hanging out with him and I started realizing that I started always starting, just kind of get drawn towards one, one of the ladies sort of on the fringes. And I'd start up a conversation and then I would just, I would just say to her at some point, I'd say, you know, I would really, you've been through a lot. I'd love to hear your story. Let me take you to a cup of, and get a cup of coffee. Would you just mind? I just want to sit and just spend some time and get to know you. And she'd go and she'd take him. She'd get coffee for him. Would you like some cake? Whatever. And she said, Kevin would go off and do his thing for a couple hours. And I would sit there listening to one person, inviting them to pour their heart out to me. And I would show them interest, and I would show them love. I would show them care and compassion. And then, as God would show the opening doors and the needs, I would start speaking life and value and the redemptive grace of Jesus Christ into their life. I'd pray for them. And, you know, I found that that was my way. That was my way of, of, of allowing Jesus to flow through me. So it's not about you becoming a cookie-cutter Christian, but it's also not about you dismissing what Jesus wants to do through you because of your perceived limitations. Here's another thing that I see people limiting themselves by. Well, that's just not my gift. That's not my calling. Listen, you're called to follow Jesus. Your gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? And so, Christ is in you. Which part of Him? The fullness of God is in Christ, and Christ is in you. So guess what? You're authorized to activate everything that He put inside of you. Yes. You're authorized to release that. And you might need a little bit of help. That's why there's equipping ministry in the body of Christ. That's why there's discipleship. But listen, God has called you to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, if you follow me, Ma Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, follow me and I will do what? Make you fishers of men. Do you know what that means? I will. If you follow me, I'll guarantee you, I will make your life so powerful and so attractive that other people will be drawn into the kingdom through you. I will teach you how to have a ministry. Now, here's the cool thing about it. You might have always thought of yourself as being part of someone else's ministry, right? I'm part of this church, or I'm part of that Bible study, and that sort of thing. God says that the equipping ministers in the body of Christ are to equip you for the, your ministry. God has given you a ministry. But here's the cool thing about it. You need to take responsibility to follow Christ, to be equipped so that He can make you a fisher of men, to take the responsibility to follow him comes with listen 
If you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake and the gospel. You can't have Jesus without gospel. Do you understand? That he entrusts to you the ministry of reconciliation. He entrusts to you the ministry of not just being a disciple, but making disciples. And my, my concern is that very often we see in churchianity Christians that are very comfortable. I want to attend. I want to just sort of receive whatever blessings I can receive. But don't ask or expect me to actually make a difference. In other people's life, this is about me. It's implied, but if you push hard enough... You'll see the selfishness go, ah! right? Anybody seen any of that? Yes. Yeah, I've seen it a lot. So here's what I want to challenge you guys right now. Is I want to challenge you to really listen to the Lord. Have you taken that place of saying, Jesus, I want to turn my life in. I don't want to just go to heaven when I die. I don't want to just go to church and get what I can out of it and add Jesus to my life. I want to lay my life down so that I can follow you. Follow you. Become like you. Be a disciple who's fully trained. When a disciple's fully trained, they'll be just like his master. I want you to make me into a fisher of men. I can't do it, but I can follow you. You'll do the, you'll do the equipping part. But you got to be 100% in. It's like Daniel San and Miyagi, you know? Karate do yes, okay. Karate do no, okay. Karate do ah, just like grape. Yeah. <laughs> you got to decide. Are you in or are you out? Don't start, don't start the process. Count the cost. And some of us, yay, it's easy to go to church, sometimes even expected. But this isn't about going to church. This is about becoming like Christ. This is about following Him. This is about the real Christian life. And here's what I want to tell you. That if you choose option B, well, I think I'm just going to go to church without actually taking the responsibility of kingdom living. I want to let you know that that is deception. That is deception. That is, there is no plan B. There is no option like that. There's no option. I just want Jesus to get me into heaven and help me have a decent family. No. And listen, sometimes the church can actually affirm one another. Well, they don't do anything different. You know, the majority of us, you know, we sort of like, we, we sort of, everything's optional. You know, we sort of listen to a sermon and it's like, that's optional. And we kind of look, nobody else did it. So, yeah, so we're kind of average. You know, this is, I'm not, not, not bad, you know. Listen. This, this, the church should be the body of Christ. The place that He is livingly expressed on the earth. The only way that your spirit can express itself is through your body. Somebody chop your tongue off, you can no longer express yourself through your tongue. They chop your legs off, you can't go where your spirit wants to take you. Jesus has put His spirit inside of you and me. He loves to express Himself to the world through you. He loves to fill you. And He's not just wanting stuff out of you. He's not, he's not trying to get everything out of you. He wants to put so much in you that it just overflows. <laughs> that, that you've got abundance of life. How much more then will you be saved through the life through His life. This is about being so stinking saved. It's not just about being barely saved. This is about being so stinking saved that you're just absolutely free from everything. You're free to love people. You're free from all the works of the enemy. You're free to to bless people. You're free from fear. You're free from anxiety. That's, That's how much He's with you. He wants you to be as absolutely free as He is. Because as He is in this world, so are we. Amen? Amen. So I know that's kind of a lot. Oh, man. Bring it. <laughs> yeah. But I want us, before we just take a break, I want to give us just a, a second just to, just to be with God and to do business with Him. And Father, I thank You for my brothers and sisters, and I thank You that You're not condemning any one of us. But you're inviting each one of us to remember that through Christ we are reconciled to you. Through Christ we are justified. 
And through you, Jesus, we can be saved from our life to live yours. So I ask right now, where there's been discouragement, where there's been setbacks, where there's been uh, hang-ups and people holding on to, to things that are drawing them away and, and from your life, we just want to lay it all down again. We lay it all down again. And we say, Lord, you are our life. Be our all in all. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.